we're going to start with joints in 2D, and pretty soon we'll get into joints in 3D, how to treat them in three-dimensional problems. But think of joints as just connections between bodies. And the way you need to think of joints is the key thing that they do um, is they limit the motions of bodies. And in what ways they limit those motions is going to be uh, the way to understand what kind of loads they apply. So the key thing is always going to be like the presence of this joint. How does it limit the motion of this object? Um, so in order to understand this, um, so first, imagine an object uh, floating in deep outer space. And uh, this is a 2D object. I'm just thinking about the motion in two dimensions. Um, well, it's capable to produce three different types of motions to this object. Um, And these three types of motions are called the degrees of freedom. Three motions possible. So the degrees of freedom. Um, it's capable of so this body, so somehow you're out there in deep outer space, alive still, and capable of moving this object around, okay, this two-dimensional object. Um, so first you can move it, you can translate it, this thing's hovering there, and you can choose any axis you want. You can translate it along that axis, okay? Um, second, you can translate it along an axis perpendicular to the first one. So along an axis perpendicular to the first axis. And with those two, I mean, you're used to this idea of a coordinate system. But with those two, you can translate it anywhere, no matter what your choice of the first axis was. If it's over here, you can move along this axis until here, and then down that way, you know, you can get anywhere you want. And then the third one is this thing's orientation can change, right? Um, so this one is a rotation in the plane. Okay, so in other words, rigid bodies in 2D have a maximum of 
of three degrees of freedom. Um, two are translational and one is rotational. Two-dimensional space. Two translational and one rotational. Okay, so now think of what it would what would be required to take away these degrees of freedom. So what would be required to take away each of these degrees of freedom? Okay, so first, now this is the object's ability to translate along that first axis. Okay, so say you tried to translate this object along this axis and it wouldn't move. Okay, that means that something else is applying a force along that axis that counteracts whatever you're doing to it. Okay, so um, there's a force. Uh, question mark. Um, So if the right force was applied along the axis, that would take away the object's ability to be translated along that axis. What about the second one that's perpendicular to that? Well, same thing. Um, so that would have to be a force uh, perpendicular to the first axis. And then what if, say, it could translate anywhere, but whenever you tried to change its orientation, it wouldn't go. What would it take to take away that degree of freedom? Um, that would require a couple. And so, um, By thinking about what degrees of freedom a joint takes away, you can figure out what loads are applied by that joint. So for example, of all the types of joints we're gonna talk about, the last one we're gonna talk about is a fixed joint or Sometimes it's called a weld joint, but it, it just says the two objects are rigidly connected, okay? And so with all of these, what you want to do is think about nothing acting on the object except that joint, and then think about how many degrees of freedom have been taken away from the three this thing would start with in outer space, okay? So if you had an object and you welded it to the cable, would you be able to translate it? Would you be able to translate it perpendicularly to that? Would you be able to change its orientation? And, and so all three degrees of freedom are taken away by a weld joint. And that means that the weld joint applies a force along some axis 
a force perpendicular to that axis and a couple. Okay, so with, that's the thought process that's going to let us go from looking at a thing in the park, and like you see a hinge here and this here and a and you know to saying to in the free body diagram saying I know there's a force in that direction over here I know there's a couple and so on. Okay. So now I'm just going to go through a list of all the two-dimensional joints that we're going to see in this class. And I have two examples that hopefully will kind of help understand. Um, and I'm going to go through it uh, in terms of categories. Uh, each one of these categories um, limits certain types of motion. Okay. So joint category one. Um, these are the joints that apply a force in one known direction. And how many variables does it take to represent a force with an unknown magnitude but a known direction? One, that's right. So because you have the magnitude that's a variable F or something, and you're multiplying it by a unit vector that you know, okay? Um, therefore, um, these introduce one variable into Newton's laws. Um, okay, the first one of these is contact without friction. We've already dealt with this one. Um, so this would show up in a problem like this. There's a surface. And then there's a body that makes contact with it like that. Uh, let's say this is body one and this is part of body two. Okay. Um, so a free body diagram of body one. would have a force perpendicular to that surface. I'll call that R. And if you were doing a free body diagram of body two, so it's just like a chunk of the ground there, uh, it would be equal and opposite. Same magnitude, but opposite direction. Okay, so let's think about this in terms of those degrees of freedom. Okay. Um, can you, so first, can you find an axis where this thing is not allowed to move? Yeah, it's not, it can't go, it can't go, this way on the axis, right? It's just the ground stops that. Okay. So we know there's a force perpendicular to that to that axis. Okay. Um, and that's what we see here. Uh, there is one thing, this could jump up off the surface. So if you ever do a calculation like this, assume the force is that way, and you get a value for R that's negative, 
that says that that force here causing movement is pulling down on that object. Like it's the least and the most application of that means either you mess something up with your calculation or this idea that you have isn't going to work. Like that needs to be a positive answer. Like uh, it needs to be a pushing contact. So we, we decided that there's a force perpendicular because it limits that degree of freedom. Okay. What about uh, the axis perpendicular to that? Can it move along that axis? Yeah. So there's no force perpendicular. And where is my axis I want to go? And what about change of orientation? Can you rotate this thing? Yeah. And so there's no compass. Um, so one thing to notice about this, I mentioned this a second ago, but um, that R value has to be positive. Um, the second joint in this category is a roller. Um, there are really two ways that you see this drawn. Uh, one is, um, well, say this body is, like that, we'll call this body one. And this is body two. Or the other way you see it drawn is like uh, this body is wearing a roller skate. Um, in this case, a free body diagram of body one again, this is a pushing force perpendicular to the surface of contact, so um, is like that. And then, a free body diagram of the second body would be equal and opposite. And again, think about uh, what degrees of freedom are removed out of this joint. Um, and when you're thinking about these uh, about these joints removing degrees of freedom, imagine that the joint is connecting into something bigger, to the ground or something. Okay, so don't think of this as another body that's able to move, even if it is. Okay, you have to think about it as if that's it. Now, what does the joint with that fixed body do that limits the, the motion of the one? So, um, body one here. Can you find an axis where translation is removed? Yeah, uh, it can't translate up or down. Okay, and so there's a force there. Now the axis perpendicular to that, is translation removed? No, it, it can roll. So there's no force perpendicular to that. And what about rotation? Can it do this? Yeah, it can do that, so there's no compass.
would be what? It would, yeah. That's right. So in two dimensions, couples, any kind of rotational thing can only have be about the z-axis. Z or negative z, yep. Uh, what do you think about the sign of this R? Can it be either, or does it have to be positive? Yeah, it has to be positive because this can only push. So, notice R has to be positive. And then the last of this type of joint is a pin and slot joint. Yep, these are all in the first category because they all introduce one direction force, a force with a known direction, and they all introduce then one variable into the equations. Um, so a pin and slot is like, these are the two bodies, and that pin that shows up in that first one can slide up and down that slot. So this is body one, this is body two. And I have one of these. One of its little, one half of its little broke off. Um, okay, so what this thing can do is, you know, it can do any of that. Can you? Right, so yeah, let's just go in order, but yeah, it's, it's free to rotate. And so, um, so we're going to imagine that the fatter part is fixed and see what, what this joint lets this thing do. So can you find an axis that restricts translation of this object? Yeah, if I um, if I try to push it or pull it perpendicular to that slot, it won't go. Okay. So it has to apply a force perpendicular to that slot. What about perpendicular to that first axis? So along the slot. It can translate, and so there's no force there. Rotation, no, it can rotate, so there's no couple. So the only force is perpendicular to that slot. Okay, that's the only load that's applied. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, so what you're always asking yourself is, is there any yeah. Where you try to translate this thing and you're stopped. Just moving up and down without changing orientation. Uh, you're looking at the plane. Okay. So, like, do you see how this, uh, like, look at it compared to this? And so, a free body diagram of body one is perpendicular to that slot. You know, if that slot, so, like if this is the direction of that slot. And these are at 90 degrees. But if I try to translate it along the slot, 
it translates freely. If I try to rotate it, it rotates freely. So that's all there is. Um, again, I'll call this R. And then if I drew a free body diagram of the second body, it would be, that force would be the same direction or parallel to it, but opposite direction. God damn it, this is so annoying. Okay, R. Okay, those two are uh, equal and opposite to each other. Uh, what about, what if I did this calculation and thought that R was negative? Is that possible in this case? Yeah, but because of the way this joint works, it can push if I try to, if I try to push it down, it stops me. And if I try to pull it up, it stops me. So this one, unlike the other two, can work in both directions. So notice that with this one, R can be positive or negative. Any other questions about, so that's all the three types of joints in this first category that introduce one variable. Um, this is a 2D problem. So when I say that these introduce one variable, how many total variables, how many total unknown you know, variables can you solve for with Newton's law, Newton's laws? Three, yep. You have three equations, the X and Y equations for Newton's second law, and the Z equation for the rotational, okay? So if you have one of these three types of joints, you can solve for two other variables along with it. Okay, so now we're going on to joint category two. Um, and there are two in this category, and each one applies a force with an unknown direction. So you can think of that as two force components, two unknown force components. Um, and so how many variables are introduced into Newton's laws um, if you have two unknown force components? It introduces two variables. Okay, so if you had a rigid body that had uh, one of the first category joints and one of these second category joints that I'm about to talk about, you could do the calculation because that would be, you know, three total variables, you have three total equations, and you can work with that. But if you had two different joints in this second category, there's no way using statics to do that calculation. It's not about like whether you're clever enough. There's no way using statics that you can use three equations to solve for four variables. Okay, so when you look at problems, a lot of times, um, at least simple problems, you can kind of count up like, okay, I know this is how many variables are gonna get introduced. Here's how many equations I'm gonna have. This is gonna work or this isn't gonna work. Um, Okay, so the first one of these is a pin joint or 
you can think of that as a hinge. And this looks something like this. where this is body one and this is body two. Um, even in pretty advanced studies of like biomechanics, uh, this is mathematically how people tend to treat knees and elbows, you know? Um, And I have a pin joint here. Okay, so it can, well, there's a lot of friction, but imagine there's no friction. Um, can you find any axis where, so say this is the, the object, the top one here is the object that we're analyzing, and I'm imagining this other one is fixed. Can you find any axis where I'm prevented from translating this top body. Yeah, any axis you choose, you can't translate it, right? If I try to go this way or this way, or there's no direction that you can translate it. So that means that um, choose your first axis, there's a force in that direction. Choose an axis perpendicular to that, there's a force in that direction. Okay, so you can think of that as an unknown force vector. There's a full vector of unknown forces that, that limits that motion. What about rotations now? Can I, can I, yeah, I can rotate it freely. Um, and so there's gonna be an unknown force vector, but no couple. Um, so a free body diagram of body one We'll just represent like this. I'll call that F. And uh, actually, let's do this with the subscripts. So we have this vector F. Uh, the way those the subscript notation for forces works, the first subscript is the body that's being acted on, and the second subscript is the one acting on it. So this is the force acting on one, on two. Okay. And on one by two, or on A by B. Okay, that's what those subscripts mean. And then the second body that's equal and opposite, we can write that as, so this force vector is the force on two by one, and Newton's third law says that that is negative F one two. Okay, any questions about that? What about the signs of these? Um, so imagine body two being fixed to the ground. Uh, could you have positive components? Yeah, could you have negative components? Yeah, I mean, it's all just like, no matter which direction you try to move, that force will keep you from moving. And then the second joint in this category is a friction contact. We already talked about these. 
with particle statics. Um, this will be this would be drawn the same way that a frictionless contact would. So the problem just has to tell you that there's friction or tell you that there's not friction. Um, and again, the way this works is so if you try to translate this body one inch into the into the surface, that is impossible. That equilibrium is eliminated. Okay. And if you try to apply this perpendicular to that first axis, the friction keeps implementing. So there's a whole vector of unknown forces. What about the green thing though? Can you know read it? Yeah, the friction doesn't have any effect on that. So again, a free body diagram of one. Looks like that, and we'll write it as the force on one by two. And a free body diagram of two. Um, the unknown force is the force on two by one. And Newton's third law says that's negative F12. Any questions about those? And now we're on to joint category three. Um, there's only one joint in this, it's a fixed joint, um, but this applies a force with an unknown direction. And a couple. And this introduces three variables into Newton's laws. Um, And the only joint in this category is a fixed joint. Or sometimes it's called a weld joint. Um, you'll see it shown like this, where the thing just meets the, meets the object next to it. Or you'll sometimes see it uh, shown like it's a sort of like a dovetail type joint. Um, those mean the same thing. Um, so let's say that that beam is body one and past the wall is body two. A free body diagram of body one. There's a force vector and that's the force on one by two. 
because all translation is eliminated. And then there's a couple that we'll call M12. That's the moment on one by two. And then if you're doing the free body diagram of the other one, Well, it can't rotate. Remember, what you're thinking of is uh, the degrees of freedom that are eliminated. It can't move at all. Yeah, right. And that's a, that's a really easy, common mistake to make. So just try to keep reminding yourself. We're not thinking about how it can move. We're thinking about how it can't move compared to something in outer space. Yeah. Yep. Yes, but um, here, let me just draw this picture and then I'll talk about that. So, uh, and then if you're doing the free body diagram of the wall, um, that would be the force on two by one. So that's negative F12. And then this is the couple on two by one, which is negative M12. Uh, Newton's third law has to work for couples, too, because couples are really pairs of forces, you know, and it works for each one of the forces. Well, that introduces three variables by itself. So if you have a problem, you know, a body with a fixed joint, it can't have any other joints attached to it, or it's statically indeterminate. You can't solve it using statics. There are other ways around it, but you just can't use the ideas of statics by themselves. Okay, uh, let me do one quick free body diagram and then we'll do the quiz and get out of here. Um, so let's draw a free body diagram. Uh, let's say that there's a pin joint over here and a roller here and a force applied there of a thousand newtons. And let's say that the mass of this beam is 50 kilograms. Um, okay, well, draw an outline of the body. At the center of mass, there's a downward force of 50 kilograms times 9.81. So that's 490.5. And then there's the 1,000 Newton force there. At the pin joint at the left, what do we know about the loads that that applies? Yep, that's a... That's a force with an unknown direction. So uh, I'll write that here as, I don't know, F. And then what do we know about the loads applied by the roller? Yep, that's a normal force perpendicular to the surface of contact. So I'll write that as R. And now is this something we could solve with statics? Yeah, because we have two unknowns for F, a third unknown for R, we have three equations, so that'll work out. Okay, let's do the quiz.